Okay, if everybody's ready, um, I want to take a few moments this morning to show you how to use the Sky, Sky Tracer tool if you haven't used it before. Um, it works well for our class because we're only um, rendering single frames for animation. It could be problematic. It does add a lot of rendering time. There is a workaround if you do plan on using it for um, animation. But um, most important, I want to show you today how to use it and also to show you that where there are some files, a lot of files in fact, in um, classic content that um, are ready-mades that will allow you to use it. Okay, you have to be in layout. That's it. It doesn't work in, um, that's the first thing. It doesn't work in modeler. And where you access it is you go to um, window and you select image processing. Okay, <coughs> we've used this before a little bit. Um, so that if you wanted to add a pixel filter here for SAS light, that's where you would do it. We can add image filters here, that sort of thing. What we want to do though is we want to select backdrop. And what we're going to do is add an environment. So we click down here, because this is, by the way, um, since I haven't covered it yet, and if you haven't discovered yet, um, the backdrop color by default is black, but you can make the backdrop color any color you want. You can also specify a gradient, and you can select a zenith color, and a sky color, and a ground color, and a nadir color. You can select these four to create sort of a, a quasi-landscape, but I don't like this at all. Uh, maybe it would work in some situations, but just solid colors or an image. You can also insert an image for a backdrop. Um, you can do that in compositing. We can cover that another time. <coughs> but I just want to cover SAS or SAS light, um, Sky Tracer today, and that's adding this. Add a. Um, I don't want that. Let me go ahead and select that. Sorry about that. Let me go ahead and remove it. Under Add Environment, we want Sky Tracer too. That's all you have to do. But the next thing is that now you have to determine the settings. What do you want this to look like? So that's where you double click and it brings up this dialog box. And this is where there are lots and lots and lots of um, settings that you can tinker with. You can determine the quality of the atmosphere. We'll start with that. We're just gonna go over one tab at a time here. Um, you can determine whether you want low, medium, or high quality. You can determine the, the thickness of the atmosphere, <coughs> luminosity, opacity. I'm going to leave the default settings here. <coughs> you can also determine, the, you know, if you want a slight haze. You know, is it, look, is it Los Angeles on a smoggy day, or is it Montana, you know, in the springtime, and it's just absolutely clear. Okay, you can determine that. So here's the, the, qual the haze quality. And uh, yeah. It's not there. That means it's probably the you need to go back and make sure that you add plugins or make sure that the plugins are that plugin is included. And if it's not there even when you do that, then that means you need to switch to another computer that somehow that plugin got removed. Cuz it is basically like an ancillary program that it's, that's attached to light waves. The next part that's really fun, that you have low altitude and high altitude clouds. <coughs> so let's go ahead and enable low, you know, some low altitude clouds and let's go ahead and enable some high altitude clouds. Look at all the settings here. <coughs> you can determine the altitude that these clouds start, the density of the clouds, the luminosity, the opacity of the clouds, the contrast. All of that good stuff. Now, which set, you know, what settings do you use? I don't know. It's um, like when Sarah was asking me about fire the other day, to adding that. There are so many settings in here. What I do is I start with the default settings, <coughs> see what they look like, and then start to tinker with it. That's all you can do. If you can find, however, a sample layout or a sample scene in classic content that maybe is a close approximation 
or maybe, you know, that we'll look at in a few moments, a sky tracer, something that's really close, use that as a starting point, and then go in and decide, okay, I want the clouds, clouds to be lower, I want more clouds, I want this, I want that, and begin to change those variables one at a time. There are just so many settings it is overwhelming. And unfortunately, one of the things that I don't like about 3D modeling is that it's n not documented well, not like Photoshop. I mean, if you can find books on Photoshop if you're, you know, to do anything and everything that Photoshop can do. <coughs> In 3D modeling, however, though, especially effects like this, there's so many settings that would be nice if they said, okay, you know, here, here's a, a list for you, and let's go to the particle, um, 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 you know, effects, like fire. Okay, I want to create a fire that looks like it's on the end of a match. You know, that's the one setting. I want to create a fire that looks like it's a campfire. I want a bonfire. I want an explosion. I want, you know, they're all different forms of fires. I want one that's on a torch. I want, you know, I want the flame that's coming out of a jet engine. You know, I mean, they're all the same tool to do that, but the settings are dramatically different. So, you know, where do you start? You know, there, it just shows you in the manual, this is where it is, but it doesn't really tell you how to do it. It's easiest if you find an existing one and then use that as a template and then build off of it. So, I've added, um, back to the sky tracer here, we ha I've added high altitude clouds and we have low altitude clouds and we have suns, plural. You can have sun one or sun two. Why would you want two suns? Because, I don't know, maybe you're creating a sci-fi thing and this planet has two suns. You can do that. We're going to leave one sun <coughs> and it's go we're going to use the light from the sky tracer generated sun to illuminate our scene. So if you're creating an outdoor scene, this would be like the sun. So depending on where the sun is, if it's in front of you, you know, it's going to cast shadows behind everything. It's going to make a lot of the, the elements that you see in silhouette, and if the sun is behind you, then you see the details of the items and the shadows are, are back. But it, you know, it, it it's simulates the real world. This is what I was talking about the other day, though, the sun position. Because oftentimes, aside from creating really interesting sunsets and evening scenes and that sort of thing, what this tool is used to do is when you're going to create a composite, and I said architecture, our architects do this, that they will want to, they'll, they'll have a photograph, and what they want to do is they want to try to simulate the same place, the same time, the same day of the year of how the sun looked, you know, the position of it. So when you, as soon as you click here, this is the sunspot, this is the distance from, you know, Earth or from the planet, whatever. And we have at the moment set one kilometer. That's very short. We'd be burned up if it was only one kilometer. Okay, but you know, you got the idea. <coughs> now, you can decide here. Look at here. Here, let's start at the bottom. Preset, it set the San Francisco. Let's sp specify Los Angeles. It puts, it knows the longitude, the latitude, and the time zone. Then we can specify the month, day, and the year. Well, it's March. And it is 2009. You can also do time lapse with an envelope. That would be kind of cool. It would take forever to render, but it'd be neat, you know. If you want to create where the sun look, the sun looks like it's going across the sky, or you have a moon or something. Um, today happens to be what is today? The 11th. And we also. It is what? It's nine. Look at how precise this can be. Nine forty. We'll just do that. I'm not going to do the second. <laughs> I don't need it that precise, but I guess I could do it. Okay. Got all my settings. Um, before I get out of this, though, one thing I want to show you because you will see we're going to sit for several minutes to watch this thing render. And we don't have anything else in here, it's just rendering this. But if you were doing an animation, and this is why I, I show this to you, or even in, in our situation, if you get a setting that you like and you're happy with and the camera isn't moving, 
<coughs> you know, relative to the, to the objects, then what you can do is you can use something called SkyBaker. And what it will do is when it renders it the first time, it creates an image of it, a still image. And that image now you can put in the background. And so for every render thereafter, it doesn't have to render this, generate this mathematically. Does that make sense? So this, this is where you would do that. That's a nice, nice tool, Sky, um, Sky Baker. <laughs> so I'll close that and I'll close this. Huh? You have a still image. Now for, for animation that becomes a problem. If the camera moves, if the character moves and the camera is still and it takes place in a relatively short amount of time, you wouldn't see any difference. But if the camera moves, you know, then, and it happens over time, then you could see how the sky would be different depending on your position. Well, it's going to look the same if you use Sky Tracer, because it's just a still image in the background. And it's very simple to put any kind of still image in the background. If you, and then on another day, what I want to show you how to do is to create a composite, a simple composite. And this is something you might want to do too with your toy. That maybe the toy is in a room, maybe it's on the beach, maybe it's someplace, and you want to make it so you don't have to build a model of a room with all the furniture in it. You don't have to build a, a beach with the sand and the ocean and everything. You could, but oftentimes, I mean, that's what you see now in film, is that you see a, a, a melding of the two, of CG and live action. And when it's done really well, you can't tell where one leaves off and the other begins. And that's really what the goal of that is. So we'll show you how, in a simple way, how to blend the two together. And for simple things, it's not difficult at all at all takes a little bit of work because of the time it takes to render and that sort of thing but we'll do that so um, let's go back and let's render it and then if you have some questions while I'm doing this I should have had this going while we we're going I'm gonna go ahead and because um, it's gonna take a few moments to um, render all this stuff because I have nothing in the scene now so all we're going to do is we're gonna see Fluffy clouds and a blue sky and a ground plane. And depending on the settings, you can create all kinds of different kinds of clouds. And that's also something I wish that they would document better. I want to create cumulus, cumulus clouds. I want to create whatever kind of clouds. <coughs> you know, how do I do that? You know, what settings do I use? Because it doesn't tell you, and I don't know. I mean, if you're going to ask me, I don't have a clue. Now, notice that we're looking just up at the sky, and that has to do with the fact of the camera angle. Okay? Look at what we're looking at here. We're just, we're looking up pretty much. So that's what that looks like. If I turn the camera down and it faces the ground, I would not see the clouds. Okay? So that's really a basic setting. So let's go ahead and clear this scene. And I will show you where these presets are. Um, this lecture is going to be shorter than I thought. So maybe I can also do SAS light as well today. Let's just do that. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll hide this. I'm going to go ahead and clear the scene. Yes, I want to clear it. And it's always going to ask me, do you want to clear the sky generated sun too? Yes. Now I'm going to go ahead and load up one of the presets. Where you find them is I want to load a scene. <coughs> we go back to the hard drive. We go to the applications folder. We scroll down to LightWave 8 folder. We go into classic content. Well, which is within the content folder, classic content. And then we want to look at scenes. And now what we'll see is it says EKI SkyGen. And when I click in here, look at all the scenes in here. All right, there's a whole bunch of them. And there are some more, too, that are really pretty nifty. So let's start with this one. Let's daytime one, and then maybe we can do a night one, and we'll see how they look. 
and let's look at the settings once we open it. So I'll go ahead and I'll open the scene. Boom. Notice how the perspective is different. The camera angle is different. Very important. You know, when you're looking at a landscape, where is the camera relative to the ground, to the horizon? What are you seeing in the, in, you know, in the sky? You know, you tip it, that will determine what you see here. So let's go ahead and render the frame. Look at that, totally different clouds. Pretty cool though, huh? Or nice looking clouds. No. So let's go ahead though and see what, how, what the cloud settings are. Now I have nothing to compare it to, but we can go in and we can take a look. So go to window, image processing, and you know what? Um, hold on here, backdrop, here's our sky gen. <coughs> oh, come on. You know what? They didn't put it in here. They just textured environment scale. So that doesn't help us. It doesn't help us to look at that. Let me look at another one and see. So I'm going to clear the scene again. Uh, clear scene. Because it doesn't have, it didn't, in order, the reason why it generated it so quickly is that it didn't use SkyGen. It had already saved it as a shader baker. So. Let's go ahead and file. Let's load another scene. Um, let's do an evening one and see what we get. And let's go ahead and render frame again. So this is similar to the other one, but notice how they changed the time and the setting. So it looks, you know, it's, it would be as if you were looking at the night sky and it was not necessarily a full moon, but there was quite a bit of light. You could see the, um, see the clouds at night. Notice what the ground plane looks like? Just black. That's down here. So the black area is, is the ground? That's the ground. That's from, that's from here down. There's one more that I would really like to find and it's really neat because it's a nice sunset um, and it's located in a different place. And it also, they created water. Looks like you're on the ocean and everything. It's really pretty nifty. So let me um, clear the scene again. And let's go to file, load scene. And I'm gonna go back again, but I need to go back a little bit. I'm gonna go back into classic content. Go back to scenes. Um, I, I'm not sure where it's at. I'm going to look in the benchmark sunset. That's what I wanted, I think. I don't know. <laughs> um, this would be as good as any. Sometimes you have to hunt around, and I don't know how they catalog these sometimes or categorize them, but I'm going to go ahead and open this one. Okay, let's look at this again from the camera view so you get an idea of what it's looking at. And... I'm going to look real quick, image processing. I'm going to look at backdrop. And it does have Sky Tracer in here. So this one will take a little bit of time. And we double click in here. And now you can look and you can compare. You would have to write down the settings. Compare these settings to the default one, the haze. Um, notice the planet radius. OK. Um, Again, we can go back to atmosphere. We can click clouds, enable clouds. You can determine altitude. This one was 500 meters, so on and so forth. And just do comparisons. But this is a good place to start. So let's go ahead and render the frame. Good, good question, I don't know. A big M, little M? Mega, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Could be um, something. It's not kilometer. That would be thousands of meters. So maybe it's um, ten thousands of meters or something like that. See how slow this is now. The other ones rendered quickly because they were already baked. So let's sit here and watch grass grow. Speaking of, that's what I'll do in the next few minutes. We'll watch grass grow. We'll put 
hair or fur on something. Um, I wish I could, I don't have any jokes. Anybody have any? Sing or dance, something like that. Um, it's just very slow. So remember, um, it's, if you do choose to use it, it is worthwhile. But remember, there's nothing in here but the backdrop, and that's it. It takes a while to do. <laughs> um, you know what? You get the idea. <laughs> this is going to take way too long. I'm going to cancel this, and I'm going to show you now how to use SAS Lite, okay? But this is one thing that you might want to use for outdoor scenes. It's pretty nice. This just takes too long. Let me go to File, Clear Scene. So Clear Sky Generated Sun, and I'm going to go back to Modeler for a moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a ball, and we're going to have a fuzzy tennis ball is what we're going to have. So let's reset. Let's activate. We just have a simple ball. So imagine this ahead, imagine this to be a, um, could be a landscape, it could be anything. So I want do I want to add grass, do I want to add fur, do I want to add hair? How do I do that? The first thing that we do in, in Modeler is you build whatever it is you want. <coughs> and instead of default settings here, I'm going to just title this Scalp. Okay, and I'm going to kind of click in here and make kind of a generic kind of tan skin tone here. You know, click OK. Ta da! Okay, and the point, the important part is I named it Scalp. Uh, let's go ahead and save it. So I'll go File, Save Object As. I'm going to save it in my, in my um, folder on the desktop, my content here, and this will be objects. And we'll name it um, head or scalp. Oh, no. How about fur demo? Now I can send it over. That, that's all you can do on here in Modeler. Now we'll go ahead and we'll send, send um, object to layout, and I have this big ball here. I should probably switch from perspective to camera view to see what it's going to look like. <coughs> now I'm ready to add fur. Um, and where you do that is two places, and this is important. You have to first go to Window and go to Image Processing. And what we're going to do is add a pixel filter in its SAS light. That's important. You don't need to change any settings in here. If you double click on here, you can see some settings that can be changed. But for, for the most part, for us, you don't need to change them. The next step is to make sure that you have the objects selected. So at the bottom, we have objects, bones, lights, cameras that we can select. We want to make sure that the object is selected. And we're going to look at object properties. Now what we're going to do is look at deform. And we're going to add a displacement map. and when we click here, notice that there's lots and lots of different different kinds of displacement maps. Well, that's what this is. It's near the bottom. at SAS Lite. This is where all the settings are. And you want to see lots of settings? Let's double click. Look at this. We can determine the fiber color. I'm going to leave the default. You can determine the brightness and hue variation, something that you should know about real hair, that it's not a single color. Even somebody with really, really blonde hair, somebody with really, really black hair, it is not a single color. There is hue variation. If it is a single color, it looks bizarre. Um, it looks very strange. And you'll see that. And this is no offense to any of you women. When you see women bleach their hair or you see them you know, have it tinted a dark black or something and it, there aren't any highlights or anything, it looks kind of bizarre. It looks like um, a doll's artificial hair. 
you know, made of artificial fibers, where it is singular in tone, okay? So you can control the brightness and the hue variation from here. We can control the diffuse. How much does it absorb light? How much does it reflect? Specular highlights, you know, is it sort of shiny hair? Is it dull hair? Is it matte? Or, you know, what are we creating here? It could be grass. Grass is sort of shiny too. We have the coarseness, the frizz quality, the clump size, you know, the hair comes in little clumps. The density, the length, the drooping, does it, does it stand straight up or does it kind of lilt, you know, list a little bit? Does it curve over? If it does list, we also can comb over it. We can have it bend in a particular direction across the X, Y, or Z axis. So you have all of these settings. My recommendation is that you start with the default, see what it looks like, and then you start, then you begin to change the um, properties, you know, in here, one or two at a time. Because if you try to change too many, you're not going to know what's working and what isn't. And this, like SkyGen, will take a while to render. Okay, so I'm just going to leave the default settings, and no, I don't want to do any of this right now. So that's it. Um, but there are some ways of refining this uh, and other things too. One thing that I didn't point out yet, that if you don't spe specify specific surfaces, it applies hair or grass or whatever it is that you're applying to everything. So right now, it's going to apply it to the whole ball. And I'll show you how you can control it in a minute, one way to control it. So we'll go ahead to render frame, and it renders the image or the, the model first, and then it applies SAS light. And when it's done, that's the last thing, you get a nice fuzzy tennis ball. It looks like a teddy bear tennis. Hold on here. I don't want that. There you go. There's your fuzzy tennis ball. Now, what if I only wanted fur to cover the top part and not the bottom part? Or I wanted just a select group of polygons for fur to be attached to? Okay? Then this is what you have to do. We have to hide this. We're going to go back to Modeler. <coughs> I'm going to zoom in here from one of these side views. And I'm just going to select the top group of polygons. So with the polygon selected, I'll go ahead and I'll click and I'll drag with my right mouse button to highlight just those top. Okay? And I'm going to hit Q, and I don't want it to be default, and I'll name it hair. The other one was scalp. This one is hair. And I can leave it the same color. Um, it doesn't have to be different, but it is a different surface. Does that make sense? It can be a different color, but it doesn't have to be. It is a different surface. Click OK. And to detect, we'll go ahead and deselect all these polys to, to know that it has a different surface. I'm going to go ahead and send or switch back to layout, and it updates it, and it doesn't look like anything has happened. But remember, if we look at surface editor, you'll notice we have hair, we have scalp. There are two surfaces here, even though they share the same color attributes. But now what I want to do with the object selected is that I need to go back to um, object properties. And I'm going to double click on SAS Light. The first checkbox is here, are the ones that you need to pay attention to. Notice that it says apply to for all surfaces. If that's what you want, fine. That's what I did. I only had one surface. I didn't care. But what I want to do now is that I want to apply fur to only name surface. You also have apply fur to all but name surface. You also can make long hair by using guide chains. That's more advanced. That would be for an advanced class. But there are some good examples. If you want to see how this is done, you have to create these IK chains, and then you have the hair follow those. And that can get really complicated when you see <coughs> and, and actually animate it. So a ponytail, you know, that kind of floats around, you know, that moves around. You have an IK chain. You have the hair follow that IK chain. Okay. 
What we're interested right now is I only want it to apply this to this one surface. Well, what surface is that? It is the hair that I named. Make sure that it's just the way that you had it. No spaces, no nothing. And we go ahead and I click OK. Now I render it again. Renders the object again. Notice it adds it to just the, t the top. <coughs> That's it. So it only adds it to that. Now it looks kind of funny. You know, it looks funny anyway. But if you wanted it to be longer, we could add length to it. If we want it to be less dense, we could do that. If we wanted to change the hair color, we could do that. If we wanted it to part, one part one side, one the other side, what would we have to do? We would have to break the hair down into two more surfaces. You would have or a total of two surfaces. We would probably have hair you know, left, hair right, and then you would have one bend one direction, one bend the other direction. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. That's how you add fur, how you add hair. I will do this again later in the semester, not too much later because we're moving on here, when I show you how to use displacement maps. Displacement maps look sort of like bump maps, but they're not. They actually reconfigure the geometry, the points on, a, on an object. And it's a great way in Modeler to build mountains, to build hills, things like that, terrain. And on that terrain, you might want to add grass or little weeds that pop up here and there. So how do you do that? That's what we're going to do. Okay. Any questions about what I've covered today? So we have sky gen. So if you want fluffy clouds or you want an evening scene or something, there's lots of presets that you can use. That you can integrate into your toy, into any of your last projects. If you're going to do um, a toy like a teddy bear, um, you have the option of adding fur to it. This um, can had a lot can um, hide a lot of bad modeling too. You know, especially when you're doing teddy bears, because you got all this fur that hides all this stuff. So. Okay, that's all I wanted to cover today. What I'm going to start um, doing on Monday is showing you some more advanced modeling techniques um, and then we're going to move on to um, we've already used some of them like bevel and smooth shift but I have some good videos to show you that um, show you a variety of different ways of approaching organic modeling okay um, but first and I haven't shown you yet how to use boolean modeling so if you want to take two separate objects and join them together or to use one as a cutter tool to cut apart, to cut holes, to actually reconfigure the geometry. Kind of like going into a wood shop and drilling a hole through a piece of wood or cutting, you know, uh, something in half or whatever, you know, using a router, things like that. That will work pretty nicely. Um, those also, um, we have not used the extrude tool. We have not used the lathe tool yet, and those can be useful too. But you'll discover, you know, it's really kind of six to one and a half a dozen of the other sometimes. Do you want to use the extrude tool or do you just want to select a polygon or tool and use or two and use bevel or smooth shift? They ultimately you get the same result. So it's just tr showing you another way of doing it. Um, there's also, um, I may have already shown you this, some added features in um, when we go over to modeler that when you select some of the tools over here, even something as simple as a box, and I don't remember whether I said this yet or not. If you want a radius, did I show you how to add a radius to it? So that you add fillets like you see here on the edge of the monitor. Some other useful tools too, um, rounder tool, which is nice, it actually will round corners for you and it can do it in any number of ways. It's kind of nice. I've had people in the past. Um, in fact, Sarah, it was you that did the dice. Maybe you could share with us how you did the dice. 
and she you, you use the rounder tool on that to get nice rounded corners and stuff and it, it it adds a lot of believability to it when you do that okay so that's what I'll start covering next week and then after that after we cover those advanced tools and techniques we're going to come back to surfacing again and then we'll cover UV maps color maps gradient maps and maybe color maps and gradient maps I'll show a video because you probably won't use them here but I want you to know about it so it will be kind of a, a nice video overview oh okay I see they're here um, displacement maps you will probably want to use at some point in the future um, UV maps you'll want to use too so I want to make sure I go over that pretty thoroughly as well okay okay that's it um, th the rest of today is a work day it's 10 o'clock Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll check you in. <coughs>